Welcome. Today I'm talking to Dr. Nasir Randisha, the ambassador of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan to the United Nations in Geneva. I'm emphasizing the name of his government to make it clear that the ambassador is not representing the Taliban regime uh, that took over his country almost uh, precisely half a year ago, but he represents the last democratically elected government that's, that was ousted and went into exile. The sad developments in his home were big news last August, but public attention has since shifted back to Europe. Ambassador Andisha will update us about the recent developments and also what they mean for Afghan uh, diplomacy. Now, Dr. Andisha is also a scholar. And for the sake of full disclosure to our viewership, I would like to add that uh, he and I wrote an article together on Ukraine, and he has uh, been contributing to another scholarly project of mine and gave a webinar in our research group five months ago. So I am certainly inclined to view him as a friend and an ally in the struggle for peaceful solutions to current conflicts. Ambassador Andisha studied in Europe and the United States. He got his PhD from Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy at the Australian National University. He served as the director of multilateral economic relations and international financial institutions. He was then appointed ambassador in 2011, serving in Australia, New Zealand, and in the Republic of Fiji. He later became the deputy foreign minister for management and resources in his home Afghanistan. And as I said, he's currently the ambassador and permanent representative of Afghanistan to the United Nations in Geneva. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Andisha, for taking the time. And let me start with a personal question to you. Like, how are you? How is your family? And especially your family back home, um, are you all getting by? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm doing okay. You know, I uh, just uh, hit bottom and raising up, uh, um, you know, in terms of everything, in terms of the collapse of a uh, country and a government, uh, and also, you know, personally, uh, family, friends, uh, and everyone who left behind in Afghanistan and few who are still in the process of evacuation and the pipeline in the neighboring countries, you know, in, in camps uh, in Europe. But, uh, but, you know, we as Afghans, uh, uh, we have a particular resilience uh, based on which, you know, we have sustained ourselves in a very uh, difficult part of the world, uh, uh, which is, you know, in the middle of uh, all these difficulties. So we have to, you know, uh, dust up, get up quickly and move on because, you know, this train of history uh, does not stop uh, for us to, you know, to, to, uh, to recuperate. So I'm... Um, I'm doing okay, family is fine, and I'm in touch with the, the rest of the family who are still inside Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm glad to hear that the fa your family is doing okay, and uh, I can only imagine how difficult this position must be that you're holding right now, uh, especially because you're representing now a government that is not in power anymore. They are, there are examples, of course, in history when things like that happened, and sometimes times get difficult. I mean, ask anyone from, uh, from Taiwan how difficult diplomacy is. I imagine you're somewhat in a, in a, in a position like that, but um, I was trying to come up with examples like the Tibetan uh, government in exile. Your government is in exile, but where, are, where is it? Where is your government at the moment? Mm -hmm. You see, there are two things in the position I'm sitting, which uh, besides being a master to Switzerland, I'm mostly involved with the uh, United Nations office in Geneva. And the United Nations office in Geneva, you know, has, uh, has a very peculiar side to it. And, and the most important element of that is humanitarian world, as well as uh, the human rights. So I think this is where my position is much more probably easier, but at the same time exciting, at the same time, you know, uh, rewarding uh, in Geneva, because I not only raise the voice of a particular government in the sense of, you know, prime minister, a president and the minister, but also a people which have been taken hostage uh, by, you know, by a group, which uh, a major part of it is designated as a terrorist group, is a group that the world, international community, United States, uh, through a UN resolution, uh, fought and dislodged, and they were harboring terrorism, and a group because of whose return 
even the U.S. court is reopening the case against Bin Laden. So, you know, if when you are sitting in my position, you will feel a, a huge responsibility that, you know, should continue that struggle because you understand that the group who has taken power by the barrel of the guns is going against everything Geneva, everything international system, everything human rights. And, and I believe, despite whatever, you know, romanticization that people in the region or some people around the world will do of the Taliban as being, you know, endogenous people, blah, blah, blah. I will say, no, you know, this is an anomaly in our, in, our, in the third decade of 21st century. So I'm sitting here and I'm, you know, uh, trying to defend the human rights of the Afghan people. I'm arguing for the humanitarian assistance to reach unimpeded, impartial, and inclusive to everyone in Afghanistan who is in need, not only to fall in the hands of, you know, a group of uh, 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 insurgent terrorist Taliban. So I'm sitting also here to, to raise the voice of all those men and women who have been, uh, uh, you know, victims of enforced disappearance, victims of, uh, you know, arbitrary detention. Uh, so I, I think that that gave me lots of energy and power. And certainly we have uh, all our embassies, no embassy of Afghanistan has surrendered to Taliban. Thankfully, the world has not recognized them as, a, as, a, as an state. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, last week they were here in a group of Taliban invited by Geneva call. But certainly, you know, when they are invited in Geneva call, uh, it is uh, applied uh, or implied that uh, they are seen as armed non-state actors. This is what Geneva call engages with because I, you know, Geneva call was working with me and still is working with me uh, here. So I think that that is that is I know peculiar in terms of diplomats and diplomacy around the world, but personally for me it's it's a very challenging at the same time rewarding uh, job that I'm doing, and perhaps it's something that I could maybe write and leave for the new generation of diplomats. Oh yes, you have to. I mean this this position that you're that you're in right now is is very special and happens only every every. Uh, every two or three decades or so when diplomats get stranded basically but that's why I, I was wondering like how does your how does your everyday look like are you are you mainly working with the uh, official UN bodies or with other organizations at the moment no I work I work uh, um, I don't call it normally but but as usual with everyone um, we also run our counselor section uh, you know which looks after some of these Afghan asylum seekers here in, in, in Switzerland. Uh, I work with all the international organizations. We issue visas, you know, um, uh, for, for people who want to go still for humanitarian work in Afghanistan. And, uh, and, and I represent the country fully because I'm the only representative Afghanistan has here, no matter what the country is. So, so that's, that's understandable. And since uh, I know, you know, human rights is, um, uh, is not completely apolitical, but I think also the Taliban understand that, you know, they cannot have uh, uh, any voice in human rights until they do not change and respect the human rights. So that's why still, you know, we are the voice of uh, human rights and we are the high voice of that 36 to 37 million Afghans who are there. So, uh, so and I'm in touch with, with civil society groups inside Afghanistan. And you're saying you're still issuing visas. That means the, the the ruling regime in Kabul actually recognizes the visas you are issuing for people then to enter the country. You see that uh, that's not a recognized uh, regime. So the system of uh, you know all the systems uh, uh, in the state of Afghanistan is still running on the basis of. A recognized uh, government or recognized system, which is the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. The passports are the same passport. The currency is the currency which was issued by the central bank, and the signature is still, you know, the signature of our uh, finance minister before. Our soccer, our football team is now playing, you know, doing a very good job in Central Asia, beating, you know, a number of countries. They're wearing the same flag that I have, you know, behind me here. And, uh, and I think this is how things are running because they don't have, uh, they don't have the system. And they understand that you know uh, they have to either accept international norms, or they can be you know a pariah uh, group holding a capital. You know the capital of uh, Yemen is also controlled by a by a group, but it doesn't mean that that's the state.
So is it is it fair to say that the Taliban were able to kind of cut off the head of the government, but the rest of the body is still working as it did in uh, before August 16? Is you know you see that uh, we have to separate two things: from state from a government. Mm -hmm. I think the state of Afghanistan is it's, it's one of the oldest members of the international community. We joined UN in 1946 together with Iceland and Sweden. Uh, November 19 is almost 75 years. So and I've been you know, very engaged in 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 the in the UN system in the regional organizations. You know in in, in many of this uh, uh, norm making around the world. If, you were norm taker, but also in, in parts, uh, part of the norm making. So with a group coming in and temporarily, because they also came in 96 to 2001, holding on to, you know, the capital and the buildings, uh, I don't call that, you know, a state. Uh, so state in entirety, a society, you know, a member of international community, a geography exists. So a group is, you know, uh, jumping in, you know, by crazy... Uh, power of the gun and the power of the suicide violence. So the rest of the society does not want to be as violent as they are. So they might, you know, uh, control that that piece of land for some time. So yes, you know, the answer is the state and institutions exist, uh, but the head of government, which is of course in a president, in, and he uh, really, you know, honestly, uh, cowardly decided to leave the country in the state of uh, moving to another part of the country and, and keeping this, you know, uh, state or government resisting the same way as I'm telling you that Yemen has, Libya has something like this right now. Uh, even in, in the Myanmar, yes, you know, uh, um, the prime minister is in and the, or, or the head of the government is in, in prison, but still, you know, there are, they are, they exists uh, a parliament uh, and the same was to some extent in, in Venezuela. But our head of state, you know, he decided to, to leave the country and flew out which is uh, really unfortunate. And he left the rest of uh, the, you know, uh, government uh, stranded. Yeah, I, I, I do think he, he probably remembered what happened to the last uh, head of government that was captured by the Taliban in 1996, right? But- um, Well, it was not necessary for him to be captured. I mean, he had still had pieces of land in the country where he could go in. Um, but you know the question is that that pro if he would have not gone probably the country would have not fallen to the Taliban. I think that's that jury is still out because you know once you remove in and that is what maybe could be part of our discussion is that uh, it's it's also going back to the, the the architecture or the structure of a very centralized state where everything uh, sums up in the person of a president. I think if it was if it was a decentralized state, if it was in a state where you know a prime minister or a head of a government can you know uh, can be taken over or can you know leave, but still the institution can stay, I think that that is also part of uh, the problem in Afghanistan, which you know we as a sort of a new generation of Afghan academic politicians and, and diplomats trying to solve for the future. So we should not face this kind of problem because every time. A person who reduces the whole state and his personality leaves, the system will evaporate. And I think that is not, uh, that has not to be the case. You know, we have seen changes of government in many places around the world, from Latin America to Africa to parts of Asia. But, but you know, one person or, or maybe a, a cabinet, 5, 10, 15 people living here and there uh, should not, uh, you know, should not result in the collapse of uh, the whole state. And certainly that's, the, that's, that's a very troubled feature of Afghanistan's politics, which means it's very centralized, one person state who is everything. And the minute that person is not there, then there is no risk of the loyalty or institution, which could keep the institutions of the state. And then we have to rebuild everything from, from zero. But on the other hand, you're saying that the institutions at the moment that were there are still running. And as I guess the foreign office your office is still running. So the Taliban did not try to get rid of all the public servants and, and el eliminate all the institutions. That, that didn't happen, right? You see, that's, uh, that's what the, the, the um, it just a small example, uh, foreign, foreign offices and a small example, although the building of foreign office and the diplomats who left in Kabul are now under the Taliban, they, you know, they appointed an acting minister. But what I'm saying is that imagine if it was a decentralized system, if the parliament would move to another another city, if 
you know, parliament had power to remove the president before we reached a point where this situation uh, uh, became inevitable. Uh, imagine if, you know, the, uh, uh, the head of state and head of government were two people uh, where, uh, you know, the security forces could have stayed loyal and then they did not need to evaporate and disappear because their commander of chief has left the cabinet. So I think that's what I'm saying is that, you know, the, this idea of checks and balances, the idea of, you know, uh, having different pillars. I mean, the, we call it three pillars of a state is that even if one pillar fails uh, or fall, then the, you know, the whole of state could stand on the other two pillars. I mean, we saw it in, in Pakistan uh, in, in, uh, around uh, President uh, Parvez Musharraf, who was a military dictator. Uh, there, it was the judiciary. You can't believe it. You know, the judges of Pakistan, uh, which is a very strong institution left by British uh, in, in, you know, in that part of the world, they came together and they really uh, um, made it very difficult for the president to, to stay and to, you know, uh, to, to continue changing perhaps the constitution because they were changing it from a, from a parliamentary system to a presidential one. And they basically forced the president out in a way that the judiciary joined hand with the parliament with the rest of political groups, oppositions. And you know, the president, despite being a military general, did not have a choice in a country like Pakistan where you know a military is everything. So that's what I'm saying that you know, institutions in Afghanistan, the the the, the whole structure of an institution from day one, from 2001, was built up on a very centralized foundation. And centralized foundations are very much susceptible. Uh, to big shocks. I mean, in the sense that they, they are fragile. And, right. and if you wanted to make it, you know, anti-fragile in places where always turbulent, you have to make it, you know, like you're in Japan. You talk of just, you know, give, give you the example of uh, architecture and buildings in Japan. So you have to make it, you know, flexible. So when there is earthquakes, it can move, but cannot fall. And our system was not, was not like that. It was very strict, like, a, like you know, like a piece of uh, uh, dry wood. You have to either break it, uh, otherwise you can't bend it. But do you see, I, mean, I remember our previous conversation where you were saying that the Taliban that are now in power face exa exactly the same structural problems inside the country and outside the country that the previous government did, just with slightly mm -hmm. different power modifications because the Americans are further away, but they are still putting pressure and we'll talk about that in a moment. But do you see a chance that the, the, the current rulers then are would start implementing like something like federalization that would be needed in order to create this kind of decentralized structures. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see any any uh, sign of that happening, because as the ideological group, as an ideological group, they are also very very centralized in their thinking, because they wanted to implement a very strict. And 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 uh, perhaps medieval uh, interpretation of of religion of Islam. Uh, so that's why when you look at this, it's uh, it's the, the concept that they they actually follow, uh, which they have you know a serious difficulty explaining it to the rest of the world, is is perhaps the concept of khilafat. Of course, they don't they don't say it in that way because if they say, then they will be you know, associated with the with the IS. So they all they believe that their leader is the leader of faithful. So when there's a leader of faithful, then there is one person, and that is the representative of God uh, on, on on the earth. That's why I'm saying it's an anomaly. You know, the world, Europe, everybody else say goodbye to this kind of system. You know. Uh, 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 at least you know a couple of centuries back, but in Afghanistan it repeats, it comes back. So the idea of decentralization exists in their mind, but in the terms of you know uh, um, a leader, a leader of faithful, and then you have different provinces where there is a representative of this person and that person and that and that leader could implement you know the Sharia on the basis of you know. Uh, uh, fatwas or something from, from this main leader. So it is strictly uh, uh, centralized according to, to their views and their vision. But the interesting thing is they as a movement, you know, as, as an insurgent terrorist movement, it was a very decentralized, because this is how 
they, they continued their insurgency. Their leadership was always in Pakistan. Their families are still in Pakistan. It's ironic that, you know, six months that they are holding power, their families are still living in Kuwait and Peshawar and different places in Karachi. So, uh, but but the, 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 the insurgency was uh, decentralized because they used to get their resources by extortion, you know, by taxing people, uh, partly by uh, by the trafficking and and protecting uh, the uh, opium smuggling uh, networks. So now the idea is how they want the, how they should in centralize this because there is uh, another difficulty for them centralizing the rest of the government uh, uh, now that they are government. So they wanted to centralize. I think this is always a difficulty, and also Afghanistan is it's it's a very diverse uh, society. And, and the Taliban represent uh, mostly the uh, the southern Pashtun groups because this is where they come from. This is where the leadership is. If you look at you know number one to number ten, so these are all the same uh, the same category of people. You know the language of Franca that they speak is not understandable in the rest of the country. Perhaps sixty percent more of the country doesn't understand. They you know basically cannot communicate uh, with them easily. Uh, so I think these are some of the difficulties. But I don't see the sign of they you know, uh, believing in decentralization because they know that in a country like Afghanistan, the minute uh, they accept this, they, the, the, re the, the uh, regions are always historically in Afghanistan more powerful, more influential, and more relevant than the center. Because we have five, six regions in Afghanistan and each region economically, uh, of course, geographically, commercially, and culturally connected to an adjacent major city in a different country. Like for example, if you talk of Western Afghanistan, the city of Herat, which is the gateway to India, it's a historical city, it's one of the you know, center of uh, culture there, poetry, you know, um, uh, miniatures, things like this, you know, it says music. Uh, that is uh, always connected uh, economically, culturally, language-wise, to the adjacent city of Mashhad in Iran, in the other side, and to, to Turkmenistan in, in its north. So uh, uh, you go there, it's, it's part of you know, an, an old uh, Persia. The uh, same is, for example, for, for Jalalabad, which is in the east of the country, is very much connected to Peshawar in Pakistan. Uh, still, you go there, you know, the currency, Pakistani currency is in circulation. Uh, you, you have... Uh, the same music you have, you know, uh, they speak same language, you know, Pashto in, in the two places. And economic wise, they're very much connected. They don't come to Kabul for something. Maybe they come to Kabul for government work, but for business, for commerce, even for weddings, for, you know, things, they go to the other side of the line into, into Pakistan. So that's, I think that's the whole uh, uh, geography and topography of the country. So the system in Afghanistan always belie the reality of the country, which is a decentralized, which is a federalized in by nature. But, but you know, always the governments in Afghanistan run against the nature, runs against the reality of, of, this, uh, of this country. And that has, you know, something to do with the, uh, with the, with the mix of population and how, and historically, you know, uh, uh, historical things, which I don't want to bore you here at this stage. It's a, it's a long other story. Yeah, but uh, the problem is like Afghanistan never had a decentralized system, right? It was it was a kingdom for for a long time and and several successions of kings until then the uh, the upheaval in the seventies and the, uh, the the communist regime, which was also very centralized. So in a sense, his history wise, it doesn't bode well for for federalizing the state in order to remodel the what's already on the ground. I think that's that's the major problem because of, uh, it's it's basically uh, was a decentralized uh, system because it was part of you know an empire always. So different parts of the country, as I say, they were they were, they were kind of you know self-sustained uh, autonomous regions, uh, and and these autonomous regions were also um, um, ethnic regions. For example, you have the Turkic community of Afghanistan, you have, you know, the Persian community of Afghanistan, and then you have the Pashtun community, and within the Pashtun community, you have two major tribes, the eastern ones, the Ghaljais, and the southern one, mostly the Durrani's. 
So there was, uh, so the, whenever they come together, they come together not even in, in a model of a federation, but actually in a model of a confederation. Mm. And the capital of this confederation used to change from Kabul to Ghazni during you know, Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi. The Ghaznavi dynasty, they ruled you know, half of India, but also some of Central Asia, the capital was in Kabul. So uh, it was not a centralized system. It was actually you know, a very decentralized one. And then uh, there was the Ghoris, which was also you know, controlling Delhi, but the capital was in Ghor, close to Herat. And, and later on, the Durrani's, uh, uh, which is you know, the, the rest of the Pashtun dynasties are coming from that. The capital was Kandahar, but you know the, the borders were in Kashmir or Delhi, you know, and in Punjab of today, even in, in parts of Iran. But but it doesn't mean that you know, for example, Badakhshan of Afghanistan was part of a centralized uh, empire in Kandahar in Kabul. No, Badakhshan was a kingdom at the time. Like you know, Mazar Balkh was its own you know autonomous region. Herat was the same, and each each region had their own uh, uh, governor general in, 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 that it was paying some tributes to, to, to government in Kabul, but then the rest of the things, they were, they were independent. And when there was an attack from across, for example, from the Tsarist Russia or from the Persian Empire or things like this, then they will solicit some support from, you know, from wherever the capital was in Kabul or in Ghazni or in Kandahar. So that's actually a de facto, this country has always been a federation of basically three people, the Pashtuns, the Tajiks, the Persian speakers, and then the Turks, the Uzbeks. And then, of course, we have a Nazara Shia community. So they came together, and then in their internal affairs, always, you know, they were independent because of geography. It's very difficult for a central state to, to have its control. And because of the no communication line, still we don't have, an, an, let's say, a, a, a rail system. A train system is not there in that country. So for somebody to reach Badakhshan, you have to go either by plane or it takes you know uh, many days to reach and going through gorges and valleys. And if you know a tribe decides not to let you, they can just close the, the you know the gate of the valley, and you can't go. You can you know you have to bring the whole army. So I think that is the contradiction. Yes, Afghanistan since 1980, uh, since 1893, which is, we call it Afghanistan from now, this is something that we have to bear in mind that before that, it used to be called Khurasan. And that was, before that, you know, it was part of an empire of, uh, of the Duranis and, and I said the Persians and the Turks and, uh, and, and the Tajiks in the North, the Sassani, uh, Samoni uh, uh, empires. But from 1893, which, you know, the British forced the king to, you know, to accept the boundaries. Uh, with this current boundary, we are, you know, from 19, from 1893 till now. And, and since then, which is 100 and now maybe 50 years or yeah, 140 years, <clears throat> there is always an attempt to centralize. And every time this centralization attempt it comes to an end at the end of each 20 years, at the end of each you know, president. So that's what you know, we argue, a group of um, academics and, and, and you know, young Afghans, that look, it's going against the nature, it's going against the geography of the country. And especially in the age and the time of, of democracy, where people's decentralization and you know, democratic aspiration is a main force. And now we are very educated, I mean, considering the rest of Afghanistan history, we have a very educated community. In the past 20 years, they have seen what democracy means. They've seen what you know, human rights mean. They've seen what the rights of different ethnic groups means, what the right of women means. I think it's very, very difficult for any group, including Taliban or whatever government comes in the future to, to re-centralize Afghanistan. Our genie is out of the box in Afghanistan. It is decentralized, but we have two choices, either to accept a political decentralization of a country and still keep it an entity, a united entity, but the decentralized one, like the one I'm sitting here in, in Switzerland. Or you have to go to something, a painful experience like Balkans, the Balkanization, because you know, in our own uh, area, you're also doing you know, this, this neutrality studies and you know, the, the geopolitics. When you have viable states, especially ethnic states around, you know, 
a geographical entity, which is called Afghanistan, uh, and you have communities, you have, you know, cross-border uh, nationalism, then it, and then the, the unit in the middle is always in turbulence, it makes it very difficult makes it very, very hard for that state to sustain. I was you know, coming across a literature recently that states can die. You know, there is a death of state, uh, especially when they you know this artificial uh, states. Uh, so because Afghanistan was, as I said, you know, geographically sandwiched in the middle of Tsarist Russia and then Communist Russia and, and, and uh, Soviet Union and uh, uh, British Empire and later on the American Empire. So this entity served as a buffer. And then later on, it became a country because this is how you know it was made. If you look at the Wahon Corridor, which extends, you know, which gives us you know some 71 mile uh, border of China, it, it was actually in 1882-83, uh, an agreement between the Foreign um, Secretary of British and the Foreign Minister of, of you know, Tsarist uh, Russia, that they agreed that this port should be given to Afghanistan so that could separate them. You know, our king at the time, he was not accepting it because a very, you know, difficult mountainous region with no resources. He said, like, and what should I do with it? They say, no, take it. They say, take it, we'll give you some subsidies to keep it. And the reason they were, that port was given to Afghanistan, which, you know, thankfully, thanks God that we have it now, because, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a natural beauty and it's a natural park right now, which has a lot of wildlife and things like this. And, and, and one of, you know, a beautiful ethnic group, the Kyrgyz are living there, you know, they have, they are still in a very nomadic community. But at the time we were like, you know, how can we even, we can't go even there. It will take us, you know, many, many days to reach. But the idea was to create a buffer where you know the the Indian uh, British India and Zara Russia could not come face to face, so to reduce the possibility of you know any kind of uh, uh, fighting or skirmishes, and then there is an extension to uh, to to the Xinjiang or Xinjiang province of uh, of China, which is you know mostly again the same kind of people. The our Tajik and Turkic people are living in Kashgar. They are living you know in Tashkurgan and and the other side. Uh, in, in Urumqi. So, so that's what this country is. And now you have, after, before, after 1947, you have Pakistan as a new state, which already became a threat to the you know, to state of Afghanistan because more than half of the Pashtun population remained on the other side of the border in a new country called Pakistan. So, when you talk of you know Afghan nation, you have you look at the Pashtun nation of Afghanistan. They are strongly represented in Pakistan. The Pakistani prime minister right now is a Pashtun. The Pakistani you know head of uh, army a number of times. You know they're very well versed in a state called Pakistan. It's a viable state, nuclear state, you know a coastal state. So the Pashtuns in Afghanistan have brothers on the other side who are you know, much more stable, much more stronger and represented. After 1992, and but still it was, you know, the definition of Afghanistan was we always try to, you know, uh, uh, quarrel with Pakistan that, you know, please give us, you know, the rest of our country and uh, uh, these communities ours. Of course, it was a, it was a useless uh, uh, discussion because, you know, once, you know, these boundaries of international community is drawn and the world recognizes it, you have to either go to the court or you have to be powerful enough to take it back like what, you know, Russia is doing. But it was not possible. It created more headache for us and for Pakistanis, which, you know, the result of, is part of the, the turbulence that we are facing is that, that the line issue. So let alone the Dural line issue, because the Dural line issue could always be used by our presidents and, and you know, some Pashtun nationalists as a, a, you know, a force, you know, as an argument to unify the rest of the country that we have a common enemy in the name of Pakistan, let all communities, you know, Persians, Tajiks, Uzbeks, Azaras, and the Pashtuns unite. And, and that was the thinking of our fathers and, and, and grandfathers. But now fast forward, 1992, we have three <laughs> other states, ethnic state, independent in the north of the country, which is Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan, which has substantial ethnic groups inside northern Afghanistan. So this is a question which came to, you know, 
to money minds that if you have again this entity which has you know either if it is the, the base or if it is pot but has all these ethnic groups where they have viable states across border and this is always in turbulent they cannot agree to create a decentralized state where they can you know work with each other and they don't have also the power to bring everyone because look the afghanistan unlike Switzerland, which you have a majority, but still, you know, they are very humble to say that we are not a majority. In Afghanistan, there is no majority. I mean, if the community is uh, 40 or less than 40 percent, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's never a majority. So you have a Pashtun community and then you have the Persian Tajik community and all of them. So there is no clear majority like China or you know, somewhere else where you can just dominate, create a an state and the rest of the small minorities has to follow you if they like it or not. That's not possible in Afghanistan. Even Taliban itself, the minute Taliban talks about, you know, Pashtun nationalism, they will disintegrate because the other Taliban groups, smaller or bigger, they can, you know, they can join uh, or they can call themselves independent and then there will be, you know, another difficulty. So 1992 onward and the state of Tajikistan. So the Tajiks of Afghanistan right now, they, when the Taliban attack, they just crossed the border and went into Tajikistan. And now Tajikistan government, always small, all the number of Tajiks in Tajikistan is lesser than the Tajiks of Afghanistan. There's more Tajiks in Afghanistan than in Tajikistan. It's the same thing that, you know, there's more Pashtuns in Pakistan than in Afghanistan. The Uzbeks of Afghanistan has a connection to Uzbekistan. The Turkmen of Afghanistan has a connection to Turkmenistan. And these states in the past 20, now 25 years, they have proven to be you know, sustainable states. Yes, they are ethnic state. Their name is Tajikistan, mean the state of Tajikistan. Huh? So, if there's a question, a rhetorical question for you know for students of political science and state, what if this you know entity is always in turbulent, and you cannot create a nation? around an idea, because Taliban cannot create a nation, because the idea is the idea of Islam, and Islam, all the other stunts are also part of Islam. So that's, that's not uh, in, in the age of nation state. The question of you know, uh, political Islam is not, is not a viable uh, uh, way of state building. So the, the whole thing is, the whole idea I'm thinking is that, uh, that we have to either decentralize in an understanding that we are better off being a country united around a very deep historical uh, legacy that we have more than Pakistan and more than, than, than Central Asia. Can we do this? Because Afghanistan, as I said, is, is much you know, historical, is much stronger in terms of its tradition of statehood than Pakistan and than, than Central Asia. Uh, or or if we can just continue, you know, this kind of every 20 years, a group comes from the north then a group comes from the south and, you know, take the government, make it inclusive of them. And then the rest of the country unites against it and, you know, throw it out. Uh, if, that, if that trend continue, it can also even question the viability of Afghan state, the state of Afghanistan. And the last point is President uh, Biden has a number of times mentioned you know, I know it's a person, maybe it's his personal thinking, not the thinking of the government of the United States, that, that this is not a one country. And that is, that's really worrisome. When Biden said that, look, you know, you cannot bring these people under one government or under one state, mean that they are different states. And we have examples of Somalia, you have example of now Iraq. Kurdistan is almost, you know, a region by itself. So, and now uh, uh, President Trump, Biden also, you know, got away with the sovereign funds of Afghanistan, which was, you know, the basic uh, uh, financial resource of the country, uh, which means that, you know, you're, they're, they're, to me, my interpretation is that the US is done with state. So they're not going to help Taliban to become a state. And if Taliban cannot become a state, they are a force. They could be a pariah force, maybe in Southern Afghanistan. And in the next summer, we will see, you know, forces coming back from the north. And I don't know what, uh, what's, what's going to unfold. So that's, uh, that's kind of, you know, an answer to your question that, that, uh, that centralization, uh, uh, I will say that centralization doesn't work in Afghanistan, will not work, and it's actually a threat to our nationhood. 
not the other way around. Decentralization is not a threat. Some people might think that decentralization or federalism will divide this country. I'm saying that no, the country is divided. Federalization is a way or decentralization is a way that can, can bring these divide elements together because we are more stronger, more viable as a one entity rather than a number of small entities. The one state that, that managed to uh, rally under the banner of Islam and create a nation around it is, uh, is Iran, right? I mean, they were more or less successful with that. But for the Taliban, the Taliban themselves have, have large divisions within them, right? So even, even within their group, this should be difficult to, to achieve uh, unity political unity. But I, you mentioned something very important, very, very current that Mr. Um, Mr. Biden, uh, President Biden, on Friday last week, um, declared that 7 billion out of the 9 billion that were frozen in the, in the Federal Reserve of Af Afghan uh, reserve money uh, would be unblocked, but half of it will be, will be given to uh, victims of 9-11 or the families of victims of 9-11 and then the other half will be somehow dispersed in whatever way to aid agencies but the, all of this is very unclear and it sounds at the moment as if though uh, the U.S. administration is aiming at uh, permanently depriving uh, the Afghan central bank from accessing its own funds which are needed in order to keep the money circulation in the country going. What are your views on that? Can you can this be supported in any sense? I mean, this makes no sense to me. I think this is outrageous, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever you think about the uh, about the Taliban, but the the, the 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 economy of Afghanistan and of the people of Afghanistan, they ha this has to work somehow. And mm -hmm. there's a there's a famine at the moment, or there's a threat of a famine at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the situation is quite dire. So, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, so, I think uh, I I was quoted by by the foreign, uh, foreign policy magazine uh, saying that exactly what I mentioned here, that to me, you know, as, as sort of an analyst, uh, let alone being an Afghan diplomat and also a concerned Afghan citizen, uh, the, uh, you know, connecting the points which, uh, uh, you know, President Biden has uh, said about Afghanistan since he was vice president in 2010 and his actions uh, makes me really worried about the future of Afghanistan as, as far as the uh, US is concerned or US democratic administration is concerned. Because I see this as part of the quantum of you know, these actions by, uh, by President Biden. But the others may not share you know, uh, my probably you know, this uh, somehow uh, gloomy interpretation. Uh, for example, the uh, special envoy for Afghanistan, uh, Mr. Thomas West, um, had a very good interaction with the USIP. He he has he had a different interpretation, which I listened to this morning, saying that look, you know what, we have taken no, we have actually helped by by this uh, uh, this executive order has been interpreted in a, in a, in in a, in a wrong way. So we are providing three and three point five million billion dollar of this fund into humanitarian action in Afghanistan, not necessarily through UN, but also through some other mechanism to reinforce blah, blah, and all of this stuff. And then the rest of them will stay because the court, uh, we are in a situation with the court. And uh, although the court, you know, uh, uh, they have sued this number is, is much higher than 3.5 uh, billion. I think it's around seven or $9 billion. So, but we don't know because the court has not decided. But, but you see here, <laughs> action speaks louder. Than, than the words, because the two things, uh, this was the sovereign fund of a country. This was a guarantee of our currency. And part of it, around 1 billion of this, was the deposits, including my deposits and my family's deposit in the local banks in Afghanistan, which are not able to pay us right now. My, pa my father goes there, he stands in the queue, you know, the whole day, and he can only receive $300 at the end of the day. So this, even going, giving it through some humanitarian assistance or you know, giving it to the victims uh, in, you know, in the principle, it's completely you know, uh, unacceptable. Uh, it's just like, you know, I invite you for my birthday and then I'll ask, you know, I'll pay from your own money. And you, know, you, you, have some, you owe me some uh, 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 
I owe you some money and I pay you from that. And then I counted later on, you know, that, okay, you know, I gave you that, that dinner, but then it was part of uh, um, the money you owe me. So I think this is, this is ridiculous. But then there's another fundamental question, which people ask to ask that why this is happening legally. Legally, because the court and the plaintiff are kind of, you know, they have reinvigorated the case since 16th of August. Because before 16th of August, this case was against the Islamic uh, Emirate of Afghanistan in 2001, started, okay? And then the Islamic Republic uh, Emirate disappeared in, you know, in, in January of 2001 or, or, or February. So the case against the Islamic Republic, I was a diplomat you know, a number of times in the US. I knew about this case, but we say, look, you know, the Islamic Emirate is no more here. It was not even a recognized entity. So the case is resurrected because Taliban called themselves the Islamic Emirate against 16th, after 16th of August, in contradiction against the wishes of the Afghan people, in contradiction to UN Security Council Resolution 20, uh, February of 2020, which was uh, Resolution 2513, uh, and against their own promises that they will not resurrect, they will not, uh, you know, bring back their defunct emirate. So just by the name of the emirate, we are losing this money. I mean, technically speaking. Uh, so there, I think there are two parties to be blamed. Number one, the Taliban, number two, the United States. And the victim is always the Afghan people, including, you know, our families who have savings in the banks. I, I absolutely agree. It's also an example of how the United States repeatedly and now again is weaponizing its position of the US dollar as the as the reserve currency of the world, because that's the only reason why the why this money is being kept there in the first place to shore up the Afghani your own uh, currency. Mm -hmm. Right. But so my question here is, uh, is there a chance that the Afghan Central Bank can somehow switch to other assets that it might still have? Are there still assets in China or in, in, in Russia that that can that can help shore up the, the currency? Although most of the of the goods that you buy in Afghanistan, I guess, would be denominated in U.S. dollars. Right. Can you explain a little bit how the yeah. how, how the economy um, works at the moment? The money economy? Uh, you know, the money economy is, is perhaps in, in the most terrible uh, uh, situation. And that's why, you know, when I worry about the state, as, as we understand that, you know, international relations and political science is non-existent in Afghanistan, because uh, it's maybe in, in, in that definition of two, two centuries back, yes, it's a group which monopolizes the use of violence, uh, by whatever mean, which is by an illegal mean, in a given territory over a certain population. I think that elements are there. But apart from that, the elements of a modern states, banking system, commerce, international recognition, doesn't exist. Constant of the people, nothing, zero. So in fact, right now, there is no central bank as, uh, yeah, there is a central bank of Afghanistan, which exists, you know, there's a building of it but there is no uh, connection between this central bank and any other entity outside. Like for example, you can, they cannot do any transaction and they cannot receive any transaction. So the banking system like now is that, uh, that whatever currency, which is you know, denominated mostly in the US dollar comes, it comes through the uh, UN agencies, I think per week $35 million, something like this. Then it's not even given to the central bank because they are under the uh, sanctions. It's given to one of our um, domestic bank, which is you know a reputable one, internationally recognized and has you know the surf system, uh, and that bank disperses. And of, of course, you know this bank then it's exchanged. This dollar is exchanged to uh, the central bank. So the central bank still has hold the Afghani currency, which is there in the circulation. It comes to them. So this is how they get some dollars but it doesn't come to them. The dollar does not come to them. They cannot go to give this dollar out in the market. So the dollar goes into a local bank and the local bank has some relationship with the central bank and then they collect the currency from, you know, from the currency traders uh, in, in open markets. We have this uh, you know, small uh, exchanges 
ca currency exchange markets uh, in Kabul. So those people will come with their with their Afghani currencies and they get you know to exchange it. But but that's just a very limited. It's a very limited uh, operation. So it's it's basically sort of you know almost a barter. I know it's a barter of uh, you know, hard currency versus you know dollar versus uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Afghani. Uh, but but the imports most of the imports are happening right now through Pakistan with a Pakistani currency, and that's again you know it, it tells you how much dependent uh, this government is becoming on on Pakistanis and on Pakistan because you can import the essential goods. Uh, of you know of staples uh, from Pakistan with the Pakistani currency, which is to some extent in circulation in the eastern and southern Afghanistan. How about China? Is there no is there no stepping up of China in order to to try mm -hmm. to fill the vacuum? Uh, Chinese at the beginning they were somehow excited that look you know what we can do things with Taliban and you know uh, this can change to a viable state, you know, they can bring some sort of stability and they can also, they can also deliver the Uyghurs, uh, especially this, you know, the Turkestan movement uh, uh, fighters and things like this. But when they jumped in and when they talked to the Taliban and when they look at, you know, the division, the internal division among them and they look at the ideological question vis-a-vis -vis these foreign fighters and, you know, the broader implication of a group like Taliban, who does not you know, respect anything the, uh, you know, international, including women rights and things like this, and, and being a huge burden. Because you know, traditionally, China is not a country which can give you huge grants of billions of, of you know, dollars. So they come up with some humanitarian assistance. And then if there is trade or business, they will do business. Otherwise, uh, uh, they, they, they are not part of you know, these uh, huge humanitarian interventions or state building interventions. So, in the first two, three months, they were very excited, but then I think they are now stepping back. Uh, we don't see serious Chinese engagement now as you know, leaving or filling the vacuum because you know after uh, 15th of August or after 31st of August, to be sure, there is there is a strategic vacuum in Afghanistan because there is no, there is no, I mean, the Americans were there and now that is uh, even, you know, the airport security is not clear that who is uh, responsible for it. So the Chinese find out, or maybe that was their understanding, that even if we step in, this is perhaps a trap by the United States laying it for us, so we can just get in and we will be you know, engaged and involved and we have to be responsible for making Taliban a responsible government. And I think they have a step back. Yes, they have an embassy, like many of our neighbors in Kabul. Uh, they send a few you know, uh, COVID vaccines and mosques and you know, a few uh, uh, tons of, of, of food supplies or medicine, uh, but nothing more than that. No, no. I think China has and China understood the enormity of the task, and they are stepping back, uh, not getting involved in 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 this issue of Taliban. Um, we are we are nearing an hour, so maybe I, I'll ask you a last question, which is. Um, are there any elements within the regime that is currently in power in Kabul that you think uh, you as a diplomat could work with? Is there any chance of diplomatic interaction with them? Or does this have to remain separate? And is your recommendation to never recognize them, to not recognize them as, a dip, as an international actor? You know, uh, in the current uh, disposition, in the current configuration, uh, it's, it's um, the answer is no, because uh, the, the caretaker or whatever government they call it is not uh, representative of the, the all Afghans. It's not representative of the Afghan woman. It's not representative of anything Afghanistan. It actually goes contrary to uh, the diversity and to the national unity of that country. And it's actually you know, a, a, a threat, as I say. Uh, does, is there elements, uh, you know, whom could be part of a system, a recognized system? Of course, yes. Taliban, uh, uh, most of them are uh, part of, you know, uh, the, the, the Afghan, the fabric of the Afghan society. They represent a way of thinking in the country. They represent a strong community of Afghanistan, you know, 
conservative uh, tribal religious community, mostly from the south of the country. Uh, they can be part of any government and they should have been part of the government. Uh, so, and even there have been a number of people who were engaged in the negotiation for the past year, two years in Doha, who understand, you know, the complexity and nuances of international relations. Uh, I will say, yes, there are elements. And even those elements, are, those are the elements we're trying to engage with, uh, with the Europe and the rest of the country and the rest of the world. But that element is very small. And because of, you know, uh, because of where they stand and, and the kind of, you know, violence they perpetrated a number of years, it's very difficult for them to separate themselves from the, from the rest. Because the minute they separate, they will be again, you know, a small group of liberal Taliban, which nobody will really care about. So I think it, it, there is still a possibility, theoretically speaking, of creating, you know, a more representative government, creating, you know, uh, an inclusive system, maybe an interim or transitional administration on the basis of some, you know, technocratic uh, uh, elements. And then we can move toward a permanent system on the basis of a decentralized, neutral country. Yes. Thank you very much. Those are very good last words to end the interview. Uh, Ambassador Andisha, um, Thank you for taking the time and I hope to speak to you soon again in the future. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.